of what God has told you and what God has written about you in his word, which requires right division, or else you're going to mess that up and think you're under the law. And so we need to understand what God has made us and who he's made us. And if you just walk or just operate and live according to who God has made you and what he has said about you and given to you freely by his grace, that is the rightly divided walk. And so that is where we're going with this. I want to give a thank you before I get going in the lesson to everyone that's helped put this on. And so I know many of you expressed that thanks as well, and I appreciate it. But from uh, the folks outside, the security guards telling you where to park, to the, uh, the people changing the paper towels in the restroom, to the AV system in the back, to the cooks and the people operating the snacks and the cheat tiers and everything else. It takes a lot of work to put these on and uh, work done not by me. And so I just want to uh, give a thank you to them uh, publicly since they're not up here as much. And so thank, thank you um, uh, all out there who are watching and listening. And thank you, thank you all for that, yeah. Yes. People ask me, you should have more than one seminar a year, and uh, more and more it's becoming easier for me. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. But it's so much work uh, for my people that aren't me. So uh, we look forward to next year's seminar. The next year's seminar's dates and the next two year's seminar's dates are in your program. And so in case you're wondering when we're going to have our next ambassador seminar, there's two the next two years there, including where we're going to have it. So you can schedule your hotels or, or what you need to uh, accommodations to, to be around there. It's going to be in Kokomo next year. So Kokomo is about 10 minutes that way. And so we're getting farther away from the cornfields. But uh, that, that's a good problem because of, of so many of you that are coming out. And so we appreciate the, the trip and the travel and the work that it took for you to drive out here as well, knowing that many of you are, are from out of state and, and take a, a lot of time to think through that. So thank you for coming out. OK. Our last session, my mic is on, All right? You can hear me OK. The last session is walking toward the mark. And I want to talk about something that maybe has the most impact when people walk or why it drives people why they walk is to get where they're going. That's why people walk. And so if you don't know where you're going when you're walking, uh, you're just wandering around quite literally. You're lost. Uh, you're just enjoying the sights. Uh, and yet most people have a destination when you walk. You, you know where you're going to get to. And this is what this session's about, knowing where our destination is, knowing what the mark is that we're walking toward. And this is something often confused, though when we read the scripture, we go, yes, of course, we're, we're singing about getting to heaven. We're singing about, you know, seeing Jesus' face, at least in the traditional old hymns we sing about that. But the way we operate often is very different. And what people walk toward in the world, what they're pursuing in life, what their purpose is. Jeremy raised the issue yesterday of asking each other, what do you do? And it's always what we're doing outside of God's will. It's like our earthly vocation, our job, which is legitimate things to discuss, but this is not the mark we're walking towards. Your life doesn't have the purpose to do what you're doing in your flesh for the last 20, 30 years, or the next 20 or 30 years. I just want to deal with that. Jeremy talked about this morning walking worthy of the Lord. An excellent lesson. Thank you, sir, for that. In Romans 12, verse 2, Romans 12, a popular verse that people use to talk about our walk as Christians. Be not conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Young people especially like this because they don't want to be conformed to what their parents and grandparents, great, we're going to be a new generation and they end up being like every other generation, but that's normal. We all were young once as well. The transforming a non-confirmation here is not something, just being a rebel to what you grew up in. It's not just looking at those around you saying, I'm going to be independent, different, not walk according to the social norms and mores. That's not what this is. The renewal of mind, as Jeremy pointed out, comes previous to chapter 12. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 deal with doctrine. 4, 5, and 6 seems like it's giving you things to do based upon what you now know in God's will. Romans 1 through 8 should be changing your mind about some things reorienting you to understand what saves you. It's not your works. Who you are in Christ, you're a servant of righteousness without doing one righteous deed. God made you that. Your identity has changed. You have the Holy Ghost in Romans chapter 8. He's done things for you. Nothing separates you from God. You learn these things. Your mind changes. So that we get to Romans 12. Then he says, don't be conformed to the world as if you didn't just learn in these last 8 to 11 chapters what the truth is. You know something different now. And because you know something different, you ought to live that way, transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, which was already stated, Romans 1 through 8. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about how you learn Jesus Christ. 
Well, you learned Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose from the dead. Yes, that's true. But that has a consequence. Romans chapter 3 deals with his faith and blood shed there for the remission of sins and for your salvation and righteousness imputed to you. But you got Romans 4 and 5 and 6 and 7 and 8 that describe who you are in Christ and all the blessings he gives to you. In Ephesians 4, in verse 20, verse 20, you have not so learned Christ. Walk not as the other Gentiles walk because you have learned Christ is the idea. What's missing from the other Gentile walk is not their good works, it's that they don't know Christ, they're not trusting Christ, their hope's not in Christ. You have not so learned Christ, you know him, if so be that you have heard him and have been taught by him. Isn't that an amazing thing to be taught by Jesus? And that's not talking about Matthew, Matthew, Luke, and John, that's talking about Jesus Christ according to the mystery. As the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. That must be some wicked lifestyle that person was leaving. Actually, that's the life all of us live without the knowledge of Jesus Christ. A lust is just something you desire, right? So you're asking people, what do you do? What's your goals in life? That's a lust. I'm trying to, des I'm desiring that. It says deceitful lusts because the deceit is that you think what you're trying to desire in life is what is most important or it's going to give you some meaning or it's going to provide for you something that you can't find anywhere else. This is the greatest thing that I can do in my life. And it's not, right? Uh, God has given you a purpose and a will that transcends, that's beyond that. And you know what it is. And so acting like it doesn't exist is deceitful. And that's why it's corrupt, because it denies the truth. Verse 23, he says, put off the former conversation and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. This is not the meditation again. This is knowing the doctrine he just explained in the first three chapters. Be renewed by how you think about things with the truth that God's revealed and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteous and true holiness. Be who God made you to be. Look at Philippians chapter three. How religious people are outside of church, it is amazing. They're religious in church too. How religious they are outside of church, we think nothing of it. They, they mock religion, they mock Christianity, they mock uh, formal religion, organized religions, right? But they themselves are very religious. We talk about walking according to what we know or, or considering other people in the group or considering if we're walking in line or worthy in that, that uh, the system of belief or thought. And we say, this is kind of complicated. This happens all the time. I bring up politics only because it's been so prominent the last year and a half. But everyone knows from either party if someone's departing from the party line, right? What did they say? That's not what is right. They don't use that word right, but this is not the party line, right? From either side. Oh, they said that. They're from that party. They're from that side. How do you know this? Did you go to seminary? I mean, political, how did you know this? <laughs> because we can know things about how people operate or think in the world. This is no different. Don't overcomplicate it. This is God's truth. You put it in your mind, that's how he's doing and how he operates. And when you hear someone, even if they say they're a Christian or in church and they don't operate or say something contrary to the word of God rightly divided, you should go, bing, that's not what, that's not right, right? But we don't. We ignore and, then, well, at least we should just love each other. That's not the mantra. The mantra is truth, right? Loving God, then loving your neighbor in the truth, speaking the truth in love, right? And so we know how to hold a party line in our flesh. Then do that in the spirit. <laughs> hold the line worthy, right, of what God's will is declared to be and what he's doing in this world. I think God's judging our country. Is this in line with what God is doing today in this dispensation? Right? I mean, use what you know from the Bible rightly divided. And it applies to a lot of things in your life your choices, your responses, your reactions, your pursuits, your desires, your responsibilities. That's your walk every day, you, you, you use those. You respond different ways for different reasons and God's word can affect that. It can change that, that's the effectual working in you. But people are religious about lots of things, except it seems like God's truth. And even if people are, it's not God's truth rightly divided, right? That should be who you are, what God said who you are, that should be your life, right? You need to put off that old thinking of who you were and the lines of demarcation the world has set up, the course of the world, and say, that's not the course I'm on. 
as Jeremy pointed out, that it looks like you're doing the same things. You go to work like your neighbor, and he's not saved. You go to a grocery store just like your neighbor, and they're not saved. But why are you doing that? If I don't eat, I'm going to die sooner than what I need to be. Right? If I don't work, I can't provide the food. On the, I mean, there's reasons why. But the ultimate reason is I have a job to do. I have a will to do. I have a life to live in Christ. But if you ask unsaved people, that's not the reason that they're doing what they're doing. What's your purpose? Well, I've got goals and plans. I want to succeed in life. I'm trying to climb this ladder. I'm trying to do this sort of thing, create this empire. I'm trying to, whatever it is. I'm trying to go travel the world, see all these things, have these experiences. I'm trying to know these people, have this relationship. I'm trying to reach this educational goal, trying to reach that financial status. I'm trying to, right? And all of us know that because all of us make those choices too. The difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is we have something more significant than all of that. Right? And in the end, all of that doesn't matter. There's a mark that we have set that is different, that God has set that is different than what the world is. Philippians 3, Paul knew what it was like to lose a status in religion. Many of you have expressed to me over the weekend in years past, it's very common to hear, when you learn the Bible rightly divided, uh, a lot of us have a history. It may be interesting to ask uh, if there's anyone here, uh, and there's a few of you, I'm pretty sure, that does not have a Christian history before learning the Bible rightly divided. So you learn right division, that's how you know Christianity. All of you know denominations. All of you know churches that failed to rightly divide. All of you learned to rightly divide and said, well, I was that before, right? I was a Baptist, Methodist, Catholic. I was something. I don't know what I was. I, I wasn't this. I was enlightened. I understood the truth, you know. You see? There was, there's no one that confessed anyway publicly. Maybe they're too shy. That I didn't know anything about Jesus until I learned the Bible rightly divided. All of you knew something or thought you knew something that may have been wrong. And you're in good hands with your pattern, the Apostle Paul, because he knew what it was like to lose a status in religion. You're in Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 5. Walking after the Spirit, of course, is not having confidence in your flesh. In Philippians 3, verse 5, Paul is explaining how he could boast in his flesh, as people often do. This was Paul's baggage. This was what Paul used to be, right? Before he knew the Bible rightly divided, which he used the language, 2 Timothy 2.15, before he knew the mystery of Christ, and that was language he used, the mystery of Christ. He was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. It wasn't one without zeal. Concerning zeal, I was persecuting the church. Like, I was persecuting the people that he thought were blasphemers. So it's like I was involved, I was circumcised, I was, I was touching the righteousness of the law. It wasn't that I was like, on the fence about right and wrong, I was blameless. I kept the law the whole thing. Now, before you say, well, you can't do that, you can do that, because then the law is offering sacrifices for your sins. So he wasn't claiming sinless perfection here. He was claiming, like, I did everything the law required. And Jews pride themselves in this, because this is a privilege and an honor for them before God. But we're not under the law. But see the boast here in his flesh? This is all his flesh. Now, we read that and go, yeah. We don't have many people saying that. Now, any former Jews here this morning, right before the only right, right division, you are a Jew, circumcised the eighth day. Tribe of Benjamin in this morning, anybody? No? Okay. No. Hebrew of the Hebrews? Pharisees? Now, he's boasting being a Pharisee, which is his own study in itself. Christians today have made that a bad word, but he's boasting because the Pharisees were the one who took the Bible literally. They were the ones that, that believed in resurrection, literally. But he was boasting in this. You could, and I'm taking a little license here because the Bible doesn't say this, but he knows what it's like to lose a status in religion because he had a status in his religion, the Jewish religion, and you might have as well. So let's reread this with the Baptist context. I was a water baptized, right? I was a church member. I was a tither on the gross, not the net, right? <laughs> I was a Baptist, not any Baptist. I was a fundamental independent Baptist. You know, it's like, wow, okay, those are credentials boasting, right? And I was a deacon. No, no I, I, this is not me. I'm just putting in here words of someone who might have had that status. I, I, I wasn't that at all, ever. But, yeah, that happens, doesn't it? Yeah. You've heard that before. That may be your history. You're like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> and that's your flesh. Oh, no, no, that's spiritual. You, water baptized, tithing at money, water. This is all flesh. This is physical. I did good. I was involved. I went to every meeting. I was in every program. I, I worked at every conference they had. This is flesh. It's the most of your flesh. I was a Roman Catholic, not one of those Catholics that aren't serious about it. I was a mass attending, Christ eating. I was a rosary praying, confessing Catholic. 
Wow, you were religious. That's what Paul's doing here. I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews, circumcised the eighth day. Like, I didn't wait till the ninth. They kept the law, right? Try a Benjamin. He was the best tribe. Yeah. So he was boasting in a religion. He knows what it's like to lose a status. He says in verse uh, 7, what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. No, wait, Paul, wait, wait, Paul. The Jewish religion prophesies of Christ, so why are you giving that up? I mean, the Jewish religion speaks about the Messiah and Isaiah. It's all over the place. You should really hold on to that so that, because it also teaches about, about Christ. No, he says, I count that with loss. Putting off all that. It didn't matter to him that he was circumcised of the Hebrew of the Hebrews. Right? Why are you putting off the Baptist stuff? Because, I mean, they, they have some truth, too. And, you know, you can bring some stuff over, and, you know, they can get you to Paul. Some of them rightly divide even. So put that stuff off. It's flesh. It's human tradition. It's not after Christ. If you're starting fresh from God's word, that's where we need to be in America, folks. That's where we need to be because there's so much mess and so much garbage tradition. You've got to start over. That's happened a few times in church history. You need to renew your mind from the scripture because you've been affected by your tradition and culture, telling you what is spiritual and actually is fleshy. He says, I count those things as loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. In verse 8, yet doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of of the Baptist statement of faith. No, for Christ, right? Jesus, Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do, it's not just loss, like I've, I've given those up, they're cut off from me, I'm losing them, giving them up. Not only giving them up, people will take them away from you. You can't teach that in our church. No longer a deacon, you're out. That should be a badge of honor, okay? In fact, you should have told them that. I no longer believe this and here's why. And then, you know, let them know that I'm no longer that because of Christ. It's not because you're a new sect and a new cult. Now I'm a mid-ex Pauline dispensationalist. I have a new statement of faith, a new group of people to follow, a new celebrity to worship. That's not it. It's Christ. If it's not Christ, give it up. We preach Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. It's Christ that we preach. And it's Christ not according to prophecy, but according to mystery. It's Jesus Christ. The reason why you would be mid acts Pauline dispensational is because you can know Christ as he wants you to know him today. You can walk in Christ as he wants you to walk in him today. That's why. Everything else you count as loss. You see, you give it up. It's excellent knowledge is what he says in verse 8. Jeremy talked about walking by faith and knowledge that you need. Well, this is excellent knowledge. This truth that he's learned that Paul was given this mystery revelation about Jesus Christ from Jesus Christ. And he counts them not just as loss, but he says as dung. Now, that's offensive, Paul. You've crossed the line. I mean, you can just say you're, you're not going to be there anymore. You don't believe it. You know, it's not a thing. But to insult the other people, really, come on. It's dung. Your Baptist doctrine stinks. Come on, just leave. Don't, like, don't throw bombs like that at us. Right? I count it but dung, that I may win Christ. You know, you don't maintain your dung around you. You don't take it with you because it was with you for a while. No, you flush it gone, okay? That you may win, Christ is what Paul says. That's the comparison. He says in verse 7 and 8, the values that he has are different. At one time, he valued being circumcised the eighth day. and he, At one time, that was what it meant to be, a follower of God, right? His values have changed. It's not the word. He's not describing here what he did differently. It's his values, it's what I value differently now, right? What about doing good works and, and the political change we're doing? And I value different things. I value God's will being done. I value his walking after his spirit. I value having no confidence in my flesh anymore. I value having hope in him and not in an institution on this planet. Your values change. And so that's what he's, he's expressing here. In verse 9, he wants to be found in him. That's in Christ. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law. If you're talking about your walk being of the law or doing a list of do's and don'ts, that's of you. It should come from Christ. The origin, the reason why, the motivation for it ought to be Christ. Otherwise, the law is of no use for you. Doing the things the law says is no use of you, including the first through ten commandments. There's no use. The reason why you should love God is because he died for you while you were still a sinner. The reason why you should love your neighbor, as was expressed yesterday, is because you're a member of the body of Christ. Your neighbor may be a member of that too. And if they're not, they can be. That's why you should love your neighbor, right? Have no other gods before you because the truth matters. 
Speak the truth in love. Without the truth, you're not saved. You see, the commandments have a whole new perspective. Because it's not lo no longer just do this or else. It's a reason why you've been given. A change in the inner man. Values have changed. Philippians 3, then in verse 9, he says, he wants to be found in Christ, having not his own righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ, which is defined in this verse as the righteousness which is of God by faith. That is what the faith of Christ means. It's not the faith according to a law, because that was the thing. You can have faith in God's words of the law, then do them. But it's the faith of Christ. Remember, he's winning Christ, the excellent knowledge of Christ. So the faith of Christ is the knowledge that the righteousness you have is of God by faith through Jesus Christ. That's what that is. This is not some idea about Jesus Christ needing to believe, like you need to believe, in something he doesn't know by sight. That's not it. This is the righteousness which is of God by faith, okay, not by the law. But he says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. Notice here in verse 9 and 10, he's moved on past the value statements that Christ is more excellent than these other things. And now he says, I want to know him and be found in him. He wants to know him and the power of his resurrection. Dustin yesterday talked about the power of death that to kill you because of sin, but then the power of death in Jesus Christ because now that you're dead in him, you're, you're crucified with Christ, you can be separated from sin. You know, you can be separated from what was killing you. Then the power of resurrection that follows. And Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death. Okay. He says in verse 11, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Do you want to know the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection? And Christians all say, yes, of course we do. Of course we do. The fellowship of his sufferings. You know, Jesus' sufferings ended up in dying. So, you want to walk in Christ? Are you willing to die? Well, yeah, I'm crucified with Christ. No, 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 I mean like, like literally die. Well, he hasn't, he hasn't said I had to do that. You're going to. You realize you're going to. We all do. And it may be, I hope it doesn't, but it, you, I hope it doesn't not for a selfish fleshly reason, but because if you're still alive, you can do the will of God to see souls saved and everything else. But if it, it may come to a point where you have to say, well, give me Christ or give me death. Which is saying the same thing as Patrick Henry said, by the way. Patrick Henry was a Christian. From all accounts you can read, trusting Christ. Give me Christ or give me death, is what he said. And so in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, he wants to attain the resurrection. This is his goal. Paul, what's your purpose in life? What's your goal? What are you trying to do? What are you building for? What are you, what are you walking through this life to do? I'm trying to attain resurrection. Why are you doing that, Paul? You're already alive. Why want to the fellowship of his sufferings? Oh, what, so you want to learn what it means to be abased? Well, he, he, wanted, he did that. But no, he means he wants to die. <sighs> this sounds suicidal. But this is the Christian teaching and the Christian walk. On your gravestone, if you have a gravestone, there will be a year at the beginning. I don't know what year that will be. And there will be a line. And there will be another year. Psalm chapter 90, verse 10 says that... The years of a man are three score and ten, right? If not, it's 70 is what it's saying. I'm saying it incorrectly. Is, am I saying it right? By reason of strength, yeah, three score and ten, which is 70. By reason of strength, four score, which is 80. So a, a long while ago, it is, this is, is very unnatural, perhaps. I calculated my death day. <laughs> like you, you had 80 years, Right? Help, or help me with the math here, somebody. I think it's 2,052, or maybe it's higher than 56. This is 70, I think. Is that right? 62, thank you. See, I, I'm anxious to get there. <laughs> this line here is the life you live. Now, that's if you live the full four score. That doesn't happen to everybody. What happens if you don't live a full life? What do people say? It was cut short. The line, cut short. They died before a full life, right? What a shame. That's what the world thinks. The mark for the Christian has changed. Look at Philippians 3, verse 13, or 12 and 13. It's not as though I'd already attained resurrection. I'm not, I'm not already dead, is what he says. Either we're already perfect. I'm not, like, glorified either. So it's like the sin is still present with me. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend now that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus... 
Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended yet, but this one thing I do. Finally, here's the thing you got to do. No, this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth under those things which are before. You're born, you're going about life, and you get saved by God's grace. You hear the gospel, and you were lost in sin, a wretched man you were. You learn about God's amazing grace, what he did for you, and you get saved. And Paul says what? Forget about those things that are behind. Your birth in the flesh is not a thing anymore. You're in Christ. You have life in him, right? Forget those things that are behind. Press forth towards what? Those things are before. Yes, this sounds like a worldly wisdom, you know? Well, you made mistakes in the past. Forget that. Just move on. You've heard that. Move on to what? Bigger and better things. Make plans for your life. Have hobbies. Do things. Move on. I mean, there's lots of life you have left, unless, of course, you're here. What do you tell that person? I'm already past the four score. <laughs> Move on? Um, <laughs> get a hobby? It's like, uh, too old for that, you know? <laughs> You're never too old. I'm 98 years old. <laughs> that, that is too old. You know, what happened? Wow, you're living a long time. Any 98 year olds here? You see? <laughs> you shouldn't joke about death like that. Death is something that Christians in the Bible should know about. Death is something the world doesn't want to talk about, doesn't want to address. It is the biggest problem in humanity because everybody dies. They still die. And it became an issue last year because what was the thing? We don't want people to die. We don't want people to die before their time, obviously. I mean, we want people to be healthy and all this. But we need to make sure there's no deaths. There's been charts of deaths, number of deaths. And how many deaths are there? It's like, whoa, everyone's dying. Everyone's always dying. They still die every day. Well, these are needless deaths. Okay, we can talk about this, but death happens. But why, why the fear? Let's talk about that. Not if we want them to die or not. I mean, there's, we, we try to stay healthy, to live. That's an obvious life is good, right? Even life from God. He made life good. But why fear it? Why is it that now that death is in front of you, you're running for the hills and will change everything about your current life to avoid that thing? Because there's no solution to that. Once you die, that's it. And this life is all there is. You only live once. Which I agree with, only I believe in eternal once living. Amen. But see, this is a Christian difference. The Bible teaches you, part of the knowledge and the faith the Bible gives you is about death. Christ died for your sins. Oh, well, I'm glad he did that so I don't have to. Well, yeah, you don't have to die for your sins, but you're going to die. Right? And if your mind isn't in the place when you realize you're going to die, that you say, amen, yes, finally. This is what I'm trying to change your mind about this morning. The mark that Christ has set for us is your death. The life you live in the flesh, you live by the faith of the Son of God, which is his righteousness by faith, because it's not your righteousness, so that you can be found in him the day that you die. There we go. You'll be found in him. If you're not in Christ on this day, what happens to you? That's a problem. Right? Paul wants to be found in him, not with his own righteousness. If you're at this day and it's your own righteousness, what's that? That's a problem. But I was righteous. I did good things. It's not the righteousness of Christ. You're not saved. You, you don't glorify God. You see, he wants to be found in him on that day in his righteousness, not his own. And if that is his goal, then how do you live here? By his righteousness, not your own. You wouldn't be like, oh, it's my righteousness until the end and finally, it's not mine, it's yours. Why would you do this? Not, not only being dishonest, it's like it's not a good witness at all. Right? I, I, I listened the other day to Christian radio. I, I don't do that very often for obvious reasons. A lot of them don't think are Christian. It's just hard to tell. But they were talking about Christian testimony. What they thought was that in the Christian life, and they were talking about an experience that had happened to them where... Um, Someone was working in a, in a job, and uh, they were a Christian. They were on time every day, never late, faithful to do their work, did it faithfully, did it well, hardworking, obedient to their, their lords and masters and whatever that was. And um, they got a promotion. There was a choice between them and someone else. And they're like, this guy, right? Because he was faithful on time, you know, and that sort of thing. Christian values, right? 
And they said, well, that is a great testimony. That, that's the best testimony a Christian can have because they were doing right and they were faithful on time and everything else, and they were promoted because of their Christian values. And that's a testimony to the world that what Christianity is. And I thought, oh, no, no. That is a terrible testimony. Hey, what's wrong with being on time? Nothing's wrong with being on time. It's a good thing, right? He got the job because the, the boss thought it was better than, than that guy over there. But that is not a Christian testimony. Testimony of self-discipline, yes. Testimony of you know, planning your time, going to sleep, on, yes. Christian testimony, no. Because how does that testify Christ? Be a Christian and your life will be better, get promotions, and you'll be on time to work every day. Is that true? It's not even true. But even if it was in your life, you're like, well, I, gotta, I, I walked a line in my life now. That's not Christ, that's you, right? What would have been a testimony is if he did not get the promotion, and they said, oh, sorry, buddy, you didn't get the promotion. He said, don't worry, this isn't my hope. My hope's in the Lord. That's a Christian testimony. But you didn't get the promotion. doesn't matter, right? My goal is not the promotion. My goal is this. That's an awkward conversation. My goal is death. I want to be found in Christ when I die with his righteousness. Your goal is death. Like, we're all trying to avoid this thing, and you're walking toward it. We all are walking toward it, right? The Christian testimony is I'm talking to you about it, and I'm still smiling. Because I'm not sadistic here, because I have a solution. It's God. It's Jesus Christ. In Philippians 3, 14, he even says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He presses toward it. Now, I'm making an assumption here that I need to define what this mark is. Okay. Where are we going? He says he reaches forth unto those things which are before. He reaches forth. Okay. He goes forward. He presses toward the mark. What is he going? What is his golden life? What is his end? What is he working for? What is he pursuing? This is a question that often, like I said, younger people are, are asked than older people because older people are over the hill. That's the way the world says it, right? You're over the hill. So if you talk about your life, and I'll for a second remember my past, right? You're young, you're growing up, you're getting older, and there's a hill. And <laughs> you're over the hill, right? So yes, young people, what are you doing? What mountain are you climbing? What are you pursuing? What's gonna be your mountaintop experience? What are you gonna contribute to the world? What's gonna be your glory? What are you gonna be? You're so special. What is it you're gonna contribute? Well, I'm working hard. I really, and secretly young people are like, I don't know. So much pressure. They're here, they're going, I gotta go where? I gotta that, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I, where I'm gonna go is that high even. You can be president. I don't, I don't, I don't wanna be president. <laughs> Astronaut, uh, space, I don't wanna go there. Right? So, like, there's a lot of pressure on young people. Especially by these people. These people look at these young people and say, you need to do something, because I didn't in my day, but you can. <laughs> you couldn't even get there. How am I going to get there? Pressure, young people, yeah, pressure. I need to attain some glory so people can look at me and say, yep, I was an engineer at NASA. I had a NASA engineer walking to my church. Like, wow, NASA engineer? Wow, it's amazing, right? A doctor, a lawyer comes in. You're a doctor? Hmm. A lawyer? Amazing. You did what? You knew who? Wow. <laughs> You got pretty high. Most of us are over the hill. I mean, you're not in the same circles anymore. You don't seem access. You don't seem abilities. You're done with life. You're just waiting for the end. But we're helping the next generation be all that they can be. Right? You see where I'm getting at, perhaps. What does over the hill even mean? I looked this up. I had to Google it because that's what my generation does. We Google things we don't know. <clears throat> what does over the hill mean? Somebody going, you don't know yet? Oh, come on. <laughs> really? I was young once, too. There was one place I found that said over the hill was 27 and above. I am above 27. It's like, wow. 27, yeah, if you haven't done my 27. In, in some fields, that's true. Like, if you're any mathematicians, if you're in mathematics and other fields like that, it's like you have most of your breakthroughs when you're young. This is historically factual. It's like, if you haven't had a major mathematical breakthrough as a mathematician by the time you're 30 or 35, it's like, I'm sorry, your brain is declining. It's just physiologically, it's like, it's probably not gonna happen. Like, you just know. These guys are either mathematical geniuses and they're gonna have a breakthrough or they're just not, you know. Go calculate data somewhere, you know. There's fields like that. 
requires the, the young synapses to be able to do something. I'm not as creative as I once was. You say, not a lot of fields. I think of sports even. Do you remember the day when you were older than the people you were watching on TV play sports? I remember that. You play sports when you're younger. So, uh, new generation does do that. They play video games. You're watching the Fortnite competition, and you're, you're thinking, I'm older than that guy. No, you don't do that. You're watching the football competition, and you're going, that guy's how old? 24? Wow. Well, I'm, not, I'm over 24. I guess I could be the coach, you know. <laughs> these, these kids are playing professional sports, getting paid millions of bucks, and you wonder why they don't know what to do with it. It's like they're young, right? Half of you don't know what to do with your money. You're not young anymore. What's over the hill? Google says over the hill. Well, they say about 40, because why? Where's 40 come from? Well, it's half of 80. And they say 80 is about a, a lifespan, an average lifespan, a length of lifespans in many countries. It's not a coincidence that the Bible thousands of years ago said by reason of strength, four score, that's 80 years. Why is that? God was a statistician. No, God knows things. But 40, says so that's the middle. So, okay, so if you're taking the average, like the median year is 40. So if the life is 80, 40 is the peak, sorry. I'm turning 40 next year. He's like, that's all you're going to be? I, I guess this is all I'm going to be. <laughs> After next year, I'm over the hill. Oh, the glove, yeah. Well, this, these are younger numbers, right? That some of them go up. They say, well, 40, that's kind of low. You know, maybe 56. In fact, there's a difference in generation, apparently. They say generations. They say millennials uh, think that 56 is old. If you're born between 1981 and 2000, you're millennial, sociologically speaking. I'm in this group. And, and they, they say 56 is old. That sounds about right, because I'm not old. I'm 56, okay, you're on the older side of old. You're on, you're on the young side of old. That's what it is, young side of old. People 56 or above, you don't want to raise your hand. Yeah, thank you, sir. That's bold. <laughs> Generation X, Generation X, you're born between 65 and 80. They say 62 is old. Now, I wonder why an older generation would raise the age there. Yeah, 62 is old. Baby boomers, born between 46 and 64, maybe more baby boomers here, say that 75 is old. Let's keep going up, you know. Yeah, yeah 75, yeah. So if you're not 75 yet, well, I'm not 75 yet, so I'm over the hill. Which means if you're not a baby boomer, you were born before that, the greatest generation, you probably think like 85 is old. You know? But that's, that's past the 80, I mean. But anyway, so it's a, it's a changing number that people think is over the hill. But what do they mean by being over the hill is more important for my lesson. What they mean is that you're beyond your prime, like physiologically, chronologically. It's like what you're going to contribute, what you're going to be, and what you're going to do. Uh, people don't peak here. They peak here, right? That's the thought of being over the hill. If you're over the hill, there's things you cannot do, things you're not going to be able to have the opportunity to have. The world places the mark on their life on this hill, right here. This is their mark, okay? If you're over the hill, what good are you? That's a very cold way to say it, but that's really kind of how the world thinks about it. That's why there's thought systems in the world, not Christian. Because Christian tends to value old people, by the way. You shouldn't say old anymore, they say. Age, what is it called, age challenge or something? I don't know what they call it. But, <laughs> Youth challenged, but they, they, they say that this is, these people are a burden to society when you get rid of them. They don't, again, they, they don't say that at the political campaign, but there's a thought. Eugenics, you ever heard of it? It's a movement of thought that if this is our prime, the people that can help human flourishing, then these folks who can't really don't matter as much, and these people who can't don't matter as much, right? So if they're struggling, get rid of them. If they're struggling, get rid of them. These are the people that matter for the world to keep operating. That's terrible, right? The reason why it's terrible is because we've been influenced by Christian culture and, and biblical teaching, which values life, all life. And in this lesson, the mark that saved people have is not here. The mark that we have is here. That's our mark, which means from here to here, that's what you're walking toward. Do you see the difference in the Christian walk? How we think about our life? When is your prime? It could be behind you when you get saved. If you get saved here, maybe your prime is in the past. I've heard that before. Well, I got saved when I was a little older. And so it's nice to see young people like you because I was older and I can't do what you're going to do. And it's like, what? So you're discounting your Christian walk and what you can do for the Lord because you're not 
in your physical, earthly body's prime, isn't that trusting your flesh? Walk up the Spirit. If you know the truth, you have the Holy Ghost, there's nothing you don't have that I don't have. In fact, if you have some worldly wisdom, some baggage of church tradition, that's something you can say, well, all that's wrong. I know about that. And I'm learning God's grace. And what I know is that I want to be found in Christ, not with my righteousness or my flesh, but in him and his righteousness. Right? When we all get to heaven, and the joke is some of us will get there before others. It's a joke, but it's a truth that the people who get there before you are in glory longer than you. They're closer to glory. And that is what we're pressing toward. You get that before me. I mean, life is good, and if life is good, glory is much better, because that's eternal life, right? Walking in Christ is good. Being with Christ is better, right? Having grace is good. Living in glory is better. This is our mark. This is the peak of your physical existence the day before you die. And you're like, well, I can't function in my body. Exactly. He wants you dead so that you can know his life, his resurrection. That's the moment when you say, I can't do it in my flesh. Isn't that sound like Paul? I have no confidence in my flesh. Good. And what do old people learn? <laughs> Not to put confidence in your flesh. Right? Young people don't know that. We're over here going, my flesh is getting better and better. You know, I can do it. I, I can do great things. These folks are going, I can't. Good. Good. Because that means you trust Christ and what he can do, right? You trust who he's made. You trust the power of his resurrection. Paul says, I want to know the power of his resurrection, which means I need to reckon myself dead, which means when he has a thorn in the flesh. These people have thorns in fleshes, Right? If these people have problems with their bodies, it's a shame to the world. Shame to everybody, right? You don't want pain and injury and sickness, but it's just natural over here. These people have the same problems. You're going, well, that's a part of life, right? Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He prayed three times to be removed. God said, nope, my grace is sufficient. Why didn't he remove it? Paul said, when I'm weak, he is strong. When you're your weakest, he can be the strongest if you're trusting him. If you're thinking and knowing what his grace provides, if you know that if this body just gave up, guess what? Glory is happening. The world thinks our prime is our youth. They glory in the youth. They think our prime is today. Well, I don't want to think about tomorrow. I don't want to think about yesterday. The prime time in your life is today. Just be in the present. It is not. The mark that we're looking pressing towards is the day you die. You say, it could be today. could be. But it's that day. It's not today because it's the present. Okay, peak attention, fame, career, retirement. I need to climb the ladder. You need to climb the ladder until the day you die. That's, that's the ladder you're working for here, the ladder of dying. It doesn't take a lot of planning to die. It doesn't take a lot of work to die. It doesn't take a lot of your own effort or ability. Anybody worried about being able to die? Here this morning. <laughs> the Christian walk is not your work. Isn't that amazing how God's done that? No one has put any effort in to die. In fact, you don't put effort in, you will die, right? You have to put effort in to stay alive. <laughs> but by life, you mean in your flesh. Mm, wow. There's reasons to stay alive in your flesh. It's the will of God he wants to perform. In fact, you cannot do what we do now here. Because there are people God wants to see saved here. There's souls he wants to see edified here. There's here where you can walk by faith. You can't walk by faith here. Glory, but you can't. So there's a ministry and a function and a will that you can only do in this life. And we have to live this life in the flesh, walking toward the mark of the high calling of God, which is death. The mark is death. Okay? Look at Philippians 3.17. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so, as you have a spur example. So you're going to mark those, not just that are good behavior. When well, these guys... We got a lawyer over there, we got a doctor over there, they're gonna mark those guys, make them deacons. Why? Well, they've achieved a high level. This is not the high calling of God. Whatever you achieve in your life, this is. That's interesting. The Bible talks about eldership, which isn't only by age, it's by truth and knowledge, right? But Philippians 3, he says, Mark them which walk 
as toward the mark, wanting to be in Christ on that day, the road of power of his resurrection, that understand the, the, the focus, the perspective, mark them as an end sample. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. What makes someone an enemy of the cross of Christ? They don't want to die. That is what makes someone an enemy of the cross of Christ. Right? Remember what Peter said to Jesus? Jesus said, I'm going to go and they're going to stone me. They're going to kill me. And in three days I'll raise again. Now Jesus said that privately to his disciples. He was not preaching it as a gospel. He didn't explain the meaning of it. He just said, according to the prophets, I'm going to go and they're going to stone me. I'm going to die and the third day they're going to raise again. And Peter responded with what? The famous words, not so Lord. Because he was expressing his love for Jesus that he not die. I mean, obviously he had good intent. Not so Lord. Which Jesus responds famously with, get thee behind me, Satan. Satan is an enemy of Jesus. And Peter, at that moment, was uttering something that was an enemy of the cross. And he didn't even know what he was saying. Like, he wanted Jesus to live because he was his Lord, you know. But there was a purpose that he had to die. We know the purpose. We know that his death is what makes us Christians. His death is what we will face as well. We've been crucified with him, but we will die. And if we don't have the hope of his resurrection, then we're just dead as a dog. He died to rise again so that you could live a life by faith in his death that you may rise again. Because you're in him. The hope of glory. The enemy of the cross, in verse 18, are those whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Okay? Where are you heading? People say, well, my goal is here. I'm trying to be that, the best. Right? Not all of you will be the best. That's my goal. I'm working towards that. What happens when you get here? And you learn it's all vanity. You talk to people who are the best. You talk to people who are on the top of their fields. And you say, where are you going? They go, higher. <laughs> Why? Aren't you high enough? Don't you have enough money? I mean, enough influence? There's no fulfillment in it. There's no completion in it. There's no finality to it. There's no eternality to it. There's no legacy in it. There's very few people that even have a legacy throughout history. And even a lot of those people are not good people. If you're heading here, your end is destruction. It's going to be a waste, right? Now, I say that in light of eternity. Obviously, you doing things in this world has a purpose if it's for the will of God to ultimately get that accomplished. You should work with your hands for the will of God, right? You should provide for those that need for the will of God. You should be involved in the affairs of this life Preach freedom and religious liberty so that the will of God can be performed. There's an ultimate purpose here, right? Everyone else does it for fleshly reasons and selfish reasons, but you're going to do it for the Lord. And it must align with what the Lord has said he's doing. Thus, walk worthy of the Lord. The enemies of the cross here have moved the mark. They, the mark is here. They've moved it to here. That's why they're an enemy. This person never faces death. They're too young for that. This person is uh, trying to attain something that will be taken from them, that is ultimately vanity, that they can't maintain because they're going to ultimately decline and they can't do that. The world lamented the death of people like John Lennon, Steve Jobs, because these people were creative contributors to society, right? Like, oh, well, they died and their life was cut shorter than what it needed to be and they could have provided so much more. Or maybe they were declining and they weren't like they used to be, and, right? What a shame, we've lost something. Not really. You've lost, lost what? Some songs? Lost what? Better iPhone? What actually is a loss? Well, yeah, it's a huge loss. I mean, swipe left. You know. <laughs> it's terrible. Whose end is instruction. Their goals are misaligned. Right? Their focus is incorrect. That's why they moved the mark. Even Christians have moved the mark. Christians are trying to attain the kingdom on earth. Which means it's still here. They're trying to build a city on a hill. Now. And if they don't, by the time they die, well, we didn't do it, but the next generation can. What are they doing? God's not even building a kingdom today. Right? In the body of Christ, we're not trying to get on top of that hill. We're trying to get here. We say, well, how hard is that? What can I contribute to that? Nothing, absolutely nothing. 
You can praise God and proclaim that it's by his strength you're going to get there, and by his strength you will live past it. That's what your testimony is as a Christian. I trust in the death and resurrection of Christ. I press toward the mark. It is very easy to glory in something on this side of death. That's not your glory. Your glory is here. Right? The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in you. Right? This is the light of affliction compared to the eternal weight of glory. Well, those are good people who suffer, but I'm not suffering. I'm on the rise. Your end is destruction. Your God is your belly. You're serving yourself, your own desires. Right? God's will is over here. It says, their God is their belly who mind earthly things. Their glory, they glory in this, that's their shame. You get it? The Christian has to reorient themselves. What the world glories in is a shame. What they're trying to pursue is destruction, is ultimately going to be destroyed. Right? They mind earthly things. We need to change our mind. This is our glory. This is not a shame. This is our mind. Heavenly things. See, that's why. That's why Paul says, set your affection on things above. That's why he says, walk that way, because this is it, your death and resurrection. That's what you're looking forward to. The mark is death, and after that, glory. Colossians 1, Christ is in you, the hope of glory. Why is Christ in me? So that when you die, you'll be found in him, and you'll have glory. That's why. The best day of your life is when you get glorified. Amen? Amen. People look back nostalgically. What was, what was the best time in your life? Well, star of the high school football team. That's a long time ago. What was the best time of your life? Graduated college. What was the best time of your life? When I became president of that company. I was the CEO of this thing. I was the vice chair of that. I was the, what was the best time of your life? It's going to be the day I die. It hasn't yet come. You say, I'm old. I, the best is behind me. No, you're old. The best is real close to you. Yeah. Amen. You see, that's a different perspective, isn't it? So we look at the people who are closer to glory going, you're almost there. It's like you talk to these people. You about did it. You're almost president. You're almost there. I could see it. <laughs> you're going to see Jesus soon. <laughs> Glory's at the door. Resurrection is the greatest day of your life. Why would we care about the things the world glories in in light of that? We just don't think about that quite often, right? That's what our affections need to be on. That's our worthy walk. The Christian walk is unique and it glorifies death in that regard. Prophecy didn't glorify death. Okay. It, the, the cross of Christ was a shame to Israel in Acts 2 and 3. But according to the mystery, the cross of Christ was a glory to us. We glory, God forbid, we glory saving the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is dead unto me and I to the world. That's the world. Okay, over the hill, that shows ignorance, right? What hill are you talking about? What's your peak? You cannot fail to meet this mark. That's the good news. The question is how you will reach it. That's the only question. How will you reach the mark? You can fall off a log and reach that mark, literally. Fall off a log and you die, right? You can get, you're going to get there. The question is how you get there. Do you get there against your will? Do you get there against everything in your bones? Do you get there without glorying in what will be? Do you get there and saying, I don't really want this? Or do you say, well, what a day that'll be when I get to heaven. How do you get there? That is the question. And that's the Christian walk. Because the world, it doesn't want to get there. It wants to ignore it. It's not going to happen. I'm going to live longer. This next, the scientists are going to create something that we can live forever. I'm hoping it's not going to work. How are you going to get here? By the Christian, we say, I'm going there. We're all going to go there, and I'm living my life now by the faith of the Son of God, so when I get there, I'll be known in Him, and I'll know His glory, and I'll finally know what He obtained for me, which is resurrection. And I want to know that now. Right? Paul looks with longing towards to die is gain. Why would I stay here? And he gives an answer to that, by the way. He says, it's for your benefit. And that's a good reason to stay. Right? And so while you're here, it's for the benefit of others. The greatest testimony the Christian can have is as you're approaching death, you say, I am rejoicing in the day that it will be. And I'm here so that I can tell you, because when I'm gone, I can't tell you anymore. That's the testimony. 
It's not how much ministry, are you, have you been a minister for how many years? Yeah, I was for 40 years a minister, but now I'm retired, so I'm past my prime. No, you have the greatest testimony now. You say, well, some people just can't do things. I get it. That's why people who can ought to, right? But people here, got, uh, they're preaching the message quite clearly. They ought to be, right? I'm rejoicing in this. Because what I'm trying to deal with, what you deal with here in ministry is people struggling in their flesh. You're trying to edify them so that you can get to the knowledge of here that when they die, they have no confidence in their flesh. And that doesn't tear them down. They glory, glory in Christ. We need to press toward the mark. What does it require? And the only place in Paul's epistles he uses the word require is the 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In case you were wondering. The only thing, the time he ever uses the word require... 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. You can't be a steward of something unless you're faithful to that which you're stewarding. This is not about money. Okay, I've got to warn that because people have only te taught things about stewardship regarding money. You've been given the truth of the mystery of Christ, the truth of you partake in his death and resurrection, the truth of you can glory in this thing the world shames in. Right? You've been given a truth about who you are. To be faithful to that. What's that mean to be faithful? You hold to it. Hold to what? The truth of who you are in Christ, what Christ has done, what your glory is in. And you hold to that how long? Till the day you die. Till you reach the mark. It's required of stewards to be faithful, to hear. So, does your faithfulness stop when you retire from full-time ministry, if that's a thing? No. If you're so old, well, I can't get into ministry, so apparently I, you know, I can't do much for the Lord. This is the mark. Faithfulness is to hear. If you're still breathing and you have time left, you can be faithful to the mark. Amen? You see? That's the Christian walk. That's the ministry. That's what it is. That's what faithfulness is going to be to that truth. You know, Constantine, the emperor Constantine, was baptized on his deathbed. You've heard that story before, perhaps. The emperor, he supposedly brought Christianity to the world. And he waited until his deathbed, which was actually a, a custom in ancient Christianity, which is not saved Christianity, but just Christianity in general. They would wait till the deathbed to get water baptized. Why would they do that? Because it was a good work that would forgive their sins, and they wanted to make sure it covered the most of them before they saw the Lord. A terrible testimony. <laughs> Do not, if you're dying next week, get water baptized the day before. Do not call the Roman Catholic priest to have him anoint you with oil. Please do not. If you can still speak in the hospital, then say, I'm trusting Christ. He's going to give me life more than you have shortly. <laughs> Goodbye. <Amen. laughs> right? What a great testimony that is. So the people around you, if you're going to have a funeral, make sure you preach the gospel because that's what I'm going to be rejoicing in the Lord in in a few minutes. Right? Christians can go to funerals and say, glory, they made it. The world thinks that's ridiculous. Why would you glory in people dying? They can't contribute. They're past the hill. No. They're high. They're the highest place they've ever been. And they didn't even do anything to get there. <laughs> they just died. God did it. Christ did it. He gives us hope, our hopes in the Lord. That's what the song says, right? That's the day of your glorification. The mind of Christ in Philippians 2. Jesus came. He died. He was, his life was cut short. Isaiah 53 says this. He died before his years. He was so, such a young man, younger than me. It was something we kind of pass around our church and in my family we talk about the Jesus year. The Jesus year is when you're 33. If you haven't attained world salvation by 33, you haven't lived up to Jesus. <laughs> Obviously, it's not what you do. Christ did things we could never do. You can't follow Jesus in that way. He was young, though, right? If he would have just stuck around, he could have done more preaching, had a bigger crowd, bigger church, more tithes, right? Bigger empire, maybe it had more influence. Well, he did change the world after that. There's that, but still... He was young. The way the world thinks about it, it's a shame that this guy dies, right? He couldn't conquer the Romans. He couldn't deliver Israel because he's dead. See, that's the world's thought, isn't it? 
And God in his wisdom said, no, it's through death I'm going to save these people. So why would you think in your life your glory is before you die? Hmm? Your glory comes when you die. That's where Paul wants to be found in him. That's the mind of Christ. And Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Christ was God and he humbled himself, which means he put on humanity so that what you saw was not God's glory, but he was still God. All the fullness of it, with every deity attribute they can exercise. And he was obedient unto death. Hebrews said he had to learn obedience. What does that mean? Because God never has to obey anybody. And when he put on humanity, suddenly he has a mother. Right? He's got a, like, a priest over there. He's subject to things higher than him. God had never been lower than when he put on humanity. And he was still God. And he obeyed unto death. Because that was his purpose, that was his mark, that was his focus. That is where he'll be glorified. Before he died, he prayed to the Father and said, glorify me, please. Which to, in his language is, I'm going to die. Kill me. That's what that is, right? He wasn't saying, glorify me, I only have a few days left, please, let's have a party. No, it's glorify me like, I'm going to die. This is your purpose, and I'm going to do it. Give me the strength to get there without crying, you know? Because that's the struggle in our flesh, right? We, we, our flesh doesn't want to die. If you walk into the Spirit, you can glory in it. It's a big difference. That's the Christian walk. Walking toward the mark from that perspective, not ignorant of it, not let that drive your priorities. Why do you do the things that you do? Why would you stop uh, such a successful career? Why would you move to a certain place? Why would, you spend your, why would you spend a whole weekend doing what we're doing here? What's the point? I want to know about that. I want to know how I can tell people about that. I want to live according to that. I want to glory. Well, my life is going to wait, uh, be a shadow in this world. I want to have glory. I'm going to press toward that mark. Our life is focused around that. Let it pre uh, reorient your priorities. Let it teach you new values. If you reach the mark, that's success. What's your goal? To die. What a great ministry. You don't see that one much, even in Christianity. Right? We're bringing the kingdom in, because that is a glorious thing in the world's eyes. Kingdom, what's that? Well, we're going to conquer the world. Yes, that's what we're trying to do, too. So you battle with the world conquering. If you get others on the same track, the same course you're on, Success. If you get others to glory in the mark, success. If you can teach them to walk in this life, how they live till the mark, success. Right? The judgment of Christ, which happens after we reach the mark, we're in glory. The judgment seat of Christ is of our lives now, not our lives here. People wonder about the judgment seat. What's he judging? He's judging how you reached here. Were you in Christ or not in Christ? And what sort of work did you do? Were you able to glorify God by his grace? It has nothing to do with your work. Like you doing good things for God, so he's going to give you money payment in heaven. That's not what it is. It's like, was his will done? Did it build the body of Christ? Are there more people entering glory? Are you glorying in the right thing? Are you faithful to the end in what he has said about you? And if you're faithful to the word of God, and you're found in him, then success. You walk the Christian life, right? Anyone can do it, right? Yes. The head shaking, yes. You can do it. Maybe you've been doing it. You've heard other people do it. It can be done, walking in Christ. Any questions, any comments about our walk to the mark? Yes. Yes.